Okay. Thanks all. Are, are there, we have any stragglers from the early morning? Okay, a couple. All right. So here we go. I started programming when I was about 10 years old. I was a little kid. I was a little bit different than most little kids. And I uh, went through some family issues and whatnot. I didn't want to be a burden on my mom. Uh, realized that I could use my skills at programming to uh, help around the house and try to take that load off of mom. And so I started my company when I was very young, about 13 years old. And I've had this IT company for 35 plus years now. My job is to keep people's computer systems up and running, contracted IT staff, and keep their network safe and secure from all the bad guys that are out there. And when I started this originally, there weren't many bad guys out there back in the day. And then as time went on, bad guys started showing up. We didn't have viruses when computers first came out. Then all of a sudden, viruses started showing up. And then we didn't have computers that were interconnected with each other either. So if some computer got infected with something, it didn't spread to other computers. Uh, but when you started transferring files back and forth, then that started happening. And then the internet shows up and computers are interconnected. And then all of a sudden you started worrying about hacking and, and whatnot. Now, I did not understand much about politics. I had no clue how our election system worked at some point, just like a normal citizen. I just figured other people were doing the politics thing. That's not my thing, but I'll let them do their thing and I'll stay focused on my thing. And I never wondered or even doubted our election system that when you go in and you fill a ballot out, that it wasn't counted accurately. I figured the people that manage this whole infrastructure obviously know what they're doing and it never was a question that it wasn't going off exactly what like it's supposed to. Did anyone else feel that way at some point? By a show of hands? Okay. By a show of hands, how many people don't feel that way now? <laughs> That's kind of why we're here. Okay. After the, well, leading up to the 2020 election, we heard there's manipulation in election systems. In fact, a lot of people were talking about it in 2016 especially, but I didn't pay much attention to that. I didn't see that in the media myself until later when I started looking back and I started seeing all of it. But it, it wasn't really known, but there were a lot of people, in fact, a lot of Democrats, that were screaming about problems with our hackable election system in 2016. And they did it solid from 16, 17, and then all of a sudden in 18, crickets. They all stopped. There were no more articles written. Everything went quiet. Why is that? Because they needed to use that broken system in 2020. Now, <clears throat> I didn't know any of this going up to 2020. All I knew is there were some people that said there were some issues with the election. Trump even said they're going to hack the election. They're going to cheat. I didn't know how they were going to cheat. I didn't know how they were going to hack it because I didn't understand the system. But I was curious. And my mom was a poll worker. And she said, son, you need to go be a poll worker. You need to get involved with the election system. She's 70, you know, mid 70 years old. She doesn't understand computers, but she had been involved for a couple of years as a poll worker and saw some things that just didn't add up to her. And so she wanted me to go look because she understood that I like to look at complex systems and figure that stuff out. So I said, okay, mom, I will do it. So I called my county. I asked them, how do I get involved? They told me the steps to go through. I went through all the steps. I got my acceptance. I started asking them questions because I was about to go be a poll watcher and I needed to know what to look for. What kinds of things should I be looking for? So I asked a lot of detailed questions. I, you know, I asked questions like, and again, back then I had no idea how the system works. So I'm just trying to think through my head, how could someone manipulate it? Okay, well, if, if someone makes a mark on a ballot, that's one of the questions I ask them. If someone like, chooses both options on a ballot, votes for two people on the same race, how is that dealt with? Oh, they said, oh, it just goes to adjudication. And then someone determines that and they make a new ballot and they were walking me through all this. And I'm trying to reason through it and understand. They said, 
don't worry, it's, it's all, everything's done perfectly and everything's out in the open. If you want to come down, you can watch. I said, I would like to do that. So I went to our elections department and actually watched. I got a tour through the whole building, all the different rooms, and I'm looking where they bring the mail-in ballots, and I look where they process it, and I look at the Agilis machine they use, that all the ballots go around in, the machine scans the envelopes, and it determines whether the signatures match, and then it puts them in different piles, and I watch where the room they take the different piles to, and I'm thinking, wow, this is the most complex operation I have ever seen, and all we're doing is having dots on a piece of paper. And I saw all these different ways that it could be manipulated. I mean, as it's going through this hall, who's following them as it goes through the hall? Who's following them as they come into the, the building? How, what, what's the programming on the machine that's actually running all that? I had so many questions, questions that no one else was asking. So I asked so many questions, and all of a sudden the elections director came over and started distracting me from asking his staff questions. Um, later on, a couple of years actually, I ran into that same elections director at an audit uh, that I was also paying attention to, and he happened to be down there to keep an eye on things in another county altogether. And he wasn't even an elections director anymore. He was hired by the SOS as a consultant to monitor an election in a county. Wasn't even an actual official at that point. Yet somehow he was allowed behind the scenes to monitor an election in a particular county, a small county in Colorado. It was weird, but when I walked in, I was like, and he, he looked the same thing. We knew each other and we chatted. We had actually a good conversation for a couple days, hours and hours, and he shared a lot of stuff with me. Uh, so anyway, I've been in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science. I have specialized in the analysis of complex systems and root cause. So I like to take really complex systems, break them into pieces, figure out how they all connect them, and figure out what the root cause of a problem is. And it's difficult for a lot of people to do, uh, but I've been very good at it since I was a little kid. I was, I was the kid that as soon as he got his hands on my first set of tools, I took everything in the house apart. Every clock, every TV, everything I could, it had screw in it, it certainly didn't have screws in it for long. And I, I was pulling the thing apart to figure out what was inside and how it worked. And, and then I, I did put it back together. My mom was happy that at least I was able to put things back together and they still worked out that I did that. So I got into election technology in 2020. A week after the 2020 election, I got a phone call. And the call went like this. Hey, Mark, my son is out in DC and trying to get to the bottom of what happened in the election. Would you be able to help them figure this stuff out with your background? I said, I absolutely, I would. What do I need to do? He said, well, we need you to go to DC. Ugh. I don't like DC. I went to DC once. I was not a fan. I don't like politics. I don't like big cities. I grew up in the country. And, uh, but I wanted to know the answer because after the election, we had half the country saying there's a problem. The other half the country said there wasn't a problem. Which was it? How can we have two completely opposing views to this? So I said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. So I jumped on a plane, flew out there, I went, Subway, which I had only been on Subway a couple times in my life, so I got to learn that. That was kind of cool. Um, got to the hotel. I went up to, I think it was the second or third floor. Knocked on the door I was told to knock on in this hotel room. And they opened the door, invited me in, and I said, hey, I'm Mark Cook. I'm an IT guy from Colorado, and I'm here to help. What can I do? What, what do you guys, what do you need? I thought I was only gonna be there for a day or two. I figured they're gonna have some manuals and they want me to look through voting system manuals and help explain things. And so they had no computers there uh, and no facilities to actually research, but there was a group of people that were there. So I found out what that was. That was Sydney Powell's <coughs> war room after the election. And that's where she operated out of in that corner hotel room in that hotel. She had been evacuated from a security threat and she and her whole group left 
and computers and printers and everything, and apparently there were still some people, stragglers, that were left behind that were a mixture of just citizens that wanted to figure this out and probably some infiltrators, I think, maybe some insiders, um, some agents from maybe three-letter agencies. Who knows? Like maybe retired, maybe good, maybe not. It was a very strange environment. And I thought I was gonna be there for a few days. I had a backpack of clothes. <clears throat> and I realized after about three days, I wasn't going anywhere. So in those first three days, I put together a whole computer system for all of those people to operate. I went out and spent $16,000 at a computer store down the street, put it on my credit cards and laptops, uh, server, firewall, all types of equipment that I thought a group of people would need in order to investigate election fraud. And the goal at that time was we got to find the fraud before January 6th. That was the big race. I had to order clothes from Amazon after I realized I wasn't leaving the hotel. I lived in that hotel for nearly two months. I had never stayed at a hotel for more than maybe two days before that. And I lived in this hotel for two months right outside of DC. It was the strangest time ever. I'm just a guy from Colorado from a small town. I was out of my zone for sure. Um, since then, I learned so many things about our election system. And I was, I was creating diagrams so people could understand what the election system looks like, how it works, how the components connect to each other, and where to look to find the fraud. I had to take guesses. Based on all this, I think if they manipulated it here, I think we would see these things here. And this is where I would look to try to find those things. Those are the types of diagrams that created. And with a group of people, we sent those to the White House, hoping that someone there would see it and say, okay, let's go do an audit here and figure this out. I didn't know if any messages were getting through until I saw a picture one day that was taken inside the White House. And one of the diagrams I helped create was up in the wall, on the wall in the White House. So at least we got it through, which was good. Um, I don't know if anyone did anything uh, with it or not. I was really hoping someone would come find me and say, okay, let's do this. I like this plan. Let's move forward and actually do an audit. Um, I was asked by a, an election uh, a registrar out in Sacramento County, California to come and do an audit of her election in California. That was in December that showed up. And I will show you the results of my trip out there. I did not get to do the audit when their county attorneys found out they called the whole thing off. But I found out a lot of very important information. So since this time, I could not unsee what I saw. And I knew that the rest of my fellow citizens had to know what's going on because had I not done what I did and go dive in, I wouldn't have known. And there's no way, and I, it needed, I needed to use every bit of knowledge and experience I had in the cyber world to understand this whole system. And I like chasing bad guys. I've been doing it my whole life. I love holding people accountable. I love holding bad people accountable. I love putting them in prison or jail. And I'm gonna enjoy doing it here too. Yes. So I have visited all kinds of states to get information about what's going on in those states and in those counties. How my mind works is I like to see patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of activity point towards a root cause. And I'm looking for that root cause. And in this case, it's many different root causes. So um, I have gained a lot of information from all these visits. My mom would take me to the puppet show when I was a little kid. Everyone's looking at the puppets, but where was I? I kept getting up. My mom said, sit down. No, nope. I got up because I was curious about something else. This is what I wanted to see. And that's how my mind has worked since I was a little kid. And I'm really enjoying looking at the strings of all this now that I have the view from up above. And watching, now I'm interested in the people and the organizations involved in pulling all the strings. That's the next phase. 
uh, and you will see, you know all those strings that are attached to that puppet? You know, they all pretty much go to the same person, right? Same thing, right? I think we're gonna start seeing that. But there's a number of puppeteers involved. So, how do we get here? I hate to be blunt, <laughs> but that's how we got here. They think you're stupid. There are very smart people that have engineered this system so well over so many years, and they resent normal citizens. They just resent us. And it's disgusting. We are the gum on the bottom of their shoe. We are an annoyance. And they have engineered a system to enslave all of us. And whether or not we know it, we are all their slaves right now. And they have used our election system to do it. And our financial systems, but they use the election system to take control of the financial system, right? Our food supply, they use the election system to subtly take control of our food supply as well. The, everything comes back to our elections. We can't fix any of these other problems. We cannot stop our kids having their genitals cut off until we fix our election system. We can fight it and fight it and fight it, but we're never gonna take control of it because everything comes back to our elections. And that's why I have basically walked away from my whole life, bought an RV and a truck, and I am traveling the state of Texas right now, trying to go county to county to help educate and open people's eyes so they know what environment we're actually in right now. Thank because you. It, it, is, it does not get any more serious than it is right now. This is it. We are in a war right now. We are in World War III, yes. in case anyone did not realize that. It looks very different than what you think a war looks like, but make no mistake, we are in World War III right now. It is at our doorstep, and we are losing. But we can win. So, who is they? Who's doing this? Well, this is who they are. It is a group of people that may be connected and maybe not so connected. It's just people that have resources and intelligence enough to be able to manipulate an ecosystem that they all contributed to in order to manipulate our lives. While we're all slaving away working, they're sucking our tax dollars up, they're giving them away, and they take their cut or they get their little payoff. And we're sitting here doing all the work as citizens. And this is not just Republicans. These are Democrats too that are also victims to this. We are all as citizens victim to globalists, to the uniparty. It's deep, it's big, but there's a really easy way we can get out of it. All we have to do is fix our election system and we can slowly remove that cancer that has metastasized. We can pick it out piece by piece. We absolutely can win this. If we couldn't, I wouldn't be wasting my time here in front of you. I would be off on a beach drinking my last beers, even though I don't drink. Um, but I know we can fix this. I know we can beat them. I know we can win. And that's why I'm giving everything I have in my life to do that because None of, none of what I've even saved up, which is dwindling, matters if we don't have a free country. If we don't have our freedoms, none of it matters. And that's why we're all here. Uh, you know, Many of us that are here aren't here for us. They're here for right there, right? Our, our kids and our grandkids that have to inherit this. And we have been asleep at the wheel and we cannot allow the disaster that we have created by being asleep at the wheel to be inherited by our kids and our grandkids because they will have no chance at fixing this. 
right now, each and every one of us, we have to do it. We are, we are it. There is no one else coming to save us. We are it. Every single person in this room could fix this county. If everyone in this room worked together and figured out how to address and mitigate the vulnerabilities in the system to get a fair election system that's verifiable by every citizen, that can't be manipulated because you can see every bit of it, you could fix this county. And if every single county did the same thing, the state could be fixed. And if every state does that, we fix our country. It's that simple. We just have to fix it at the local levels. Now there's some other people working from top down. That has not worked so well. I've tried to do that for two years. It doesn't work real well. I tried to work at the state top level for months. Uh, Clint and I, and Jody back there, we spent weeks at the Capitol here in Texas talking to legislator after legislator after legislator, trying to get laws put in place to protect the system. We could barely get anything through. It was a joke. And I thought after all that, and you know that massive defeat after all that time, we planted some seeds. But I figured we need something different. We need to actually attack this in a way that is outside of the service envelope of the people manipulating this whole thing. When we get down to the physical domain in the counties, they can't do that. They don't have the resources to do it because it's a small group of people. That I'm, I'll go to each county, one by one, I'll spend these hours with you. They sit there and manipulate the media and they're able to reach a whole lot of people by manipulating media, but they're not coming down here talking to you person to person. <clears throat> so that's why I'm doing this. Um, I don't like them. We deserve better. So the election ecosystem, you have to understand how the whole thing works to understand how we fix it. There's four components to that system. The voter registration database, which contains a list of names and addresses that are allowed to vote. Not people that are allowed to vote though. We used to have people that were allowed to vote. Every person, every citizen got a vote in the election, right? That's not the case anymore. Now, in every entry in the voter registration database gets to vote in the election. It's a very important distinction. You have to make that connection. It's an entry in a database that gets to vote. So if you inject some entries in that database or someone does, Guess how many more votes get to be in the system? There's the first part of the fraud. That disconnection between the person and the entry in a database. So the voter registration system controls the number of ballots in circulation. If you inject 50,000 entries into that database, you're gonna have another 50,000 potential ballots, 50,000 potential votes. So in Colorado, they mail out a ballot to every single entry in that database <coughs> without asking. They're gonna mail them out. If someone throws in extra million records, they're gonna mail out a million extra ballots and they're gonna go to whatever addresses are in that database. So if I wanted to manipulate that system, I would just put a whole bunch of names in that database. I would put addresses that don't exist. So I would know that they would be returned to sender and they would actually go back to the post office and sit in piles. And then I would get access to those ballots that are sitting in the piles at the post office. I would vote those ballots and then put them back in the mail again. And then they'd be counted in the election. And I have talked to people that work at the post office and that's what they told me is happening. They have piles of ballots that did not make it to the uh, recipient stacks of them and then the stacks just gradually start disappearing they don't know where they're going another one they'll do is they'll send the, the return address of these ballots will be someone's p.o box and then an ngo will monitor that p.o box and grab those ballots and now they can just fill them out and throw them in and they're counted total lack of control of this system we cannot trust mail-in ballots why do you think this event happened that forced the use of mail-in ballots across the entire country? 
It was, yeah, it was not an accident. It checked off a lot of things for the globalists, but the one thing they needed the most was they had to have mail-in ballots because they could not cheat enough through their normal cheating methods to overcome the real vote because there's so much support for a particular candidate or a particular movement. And they saw that in 2016. Their normal methods that they had been using for years, subtly here and there, they didn't have enough to pull it off. And so they said, the only way we can do it, I'm sure they scratched their head and said, well, the only way we could do it is if we could just inject ballots everywhere. Well, how do we inject ballots everywhere? We're, we're gonna need mail-in ballots all over. Well, states aren't adopting mail-in ballots fast enough. How do we force them all to adopt mail-in ballots as quick as possible? Gosh, we're gonna have to have some type of like national disaster or emergency or something. Something that would force people in to, in, so they would understand that they have to go to mail-in ballots. Let's distract them. Brilliant, it was brilliant. COVID was brilliant. So voter registration system, that's a very, very critical component. Next component is the voter validation system. And there's two parts to that, one for mail-in ballots and one for in-person. So let's talk about the mail-in ballots. <coughs> when I said people could inject records into the registration system and then they could vote those ballots, they come back into the system, what is to protect those ballots from actually getting counted? That's what the validation system is supposed to do. It's the TSA of our ballots. So TSA is supposed to make sure no bombs or guns or knives get passed into the planes. Likewise, our voter validation system, the signature verification, is supposed to make sure that no illegitimate ballot makes it into the system. So how many people are signature verifiers here? Raise your hands. Two, okay. How many minutes, hours, days, weeks of training did you have? Zero? Did you have even a minute of training? Minute. Minute. How, how much training did you have? Basically, it was taking the driver's license, scanning it, and then turning it over to see if the name matched. We really didn't even say anything about the system. Was it for mail-in ballots? No, it was... For them to come in. That's okay, that was in person, but you did mail-ins, right? Okay, all right, so we only had one that did mail-ins that there. Okay, a minute of training. Now, after you went through that grueling minute of training, <laughs> in the test they gave you to see if you learned what you needed to learn in the training to prove that you could do the job correctly without error, how long did it take you to take that test? Oh, there was no test. Okay, so you got trained for upwards of a minute, and then they didn't test you to see if you even knew how to do it right. Okay, so it's BS. Clearly, there's no intention for signature verification to actually really verify a signature. It's smoke and mirrors. It's going through the motions to distract the ignorant, that we don't know any better. They're taking advantage of us. Good people don't think about how a bad person might take advantage of them, because we don't think like that. Bad people, all they do is think about how to take advantage of a situation or of a person or people. That is their methodology. But if we don't think like that ourselves, we can't see it when someone else does it to us. And that's the problem. Being a good person is you're a prime target for a bad person. 